For years, private pilot candidates have been memorizing and reciting A Tomato Flames and FLAPS. While these acronyms are a useful way to remember the required equipment from 14 CFR 91205, they don't provide the information necessary to determine if an aircraft can be flown with an operative equipment. The FAA recommends a better way. Let's get started. Let me ask you a question. What instruments and equipment should be working on an airplane? If you answered all of them, you're correct. Every instrument and part installed on an aircraft should be functional. Unfortunately, that's not always true. When you find an operative equipment, the FAA provides step-by-step -step guidance for how to decide whether or not a flight can be made in 14 CFR 91213. While it uses roundabout language, 14 CFR 91213A through C notes that if you have or need an approved minimum equipment list, otherwise known as an MEL, you need to make sure you can make the flight under the conditions and limitations defined within the MEL. However, most small aircraft do not have or need an MEL. If yours doesn't, the second step is to determine whether or not the inoperative component is part of the VFR day equipment required within the type certification. This information can be found by looking in the Equipment section of the Type Certification Data Sheet, or TCDS, for your airplane. By the way, while not required reading, there is a lot of interesting information in the TCDS, and I would recommend downloading a copy for the airplane that you fly. The third step is to determine whether or not the equipment is required as part of the aircraft's equipment list or a kinds of operation equipment list, otherwise known as the KOEL. The equipment list is often found in Section 6 of the POH along with the weight and balance information. Not all aircraft have a KOEL, but if yours does, it will be listed in Section 2 of the POH. The fourth step is to determine if the equipment is required by 91205, 91207, or another CFR. This is where A Tomato Flames or Flaps comes in. The fifth step is to determine if the equipment is required by Airworthiness Directive. This search may take a little longer because it can be difficult to determine all of the ADs that apply to your specific aircraft. It would be best to work with your aviation mechanic to make a list of any equipment that might fall under this category. Even if the equipment is not required by the previous five steps, you still aren't finished. In the sixth step, before flying, you will either need to remove or deactivate the equipment and the cockpit controls and indicators must be placarded as inoperative. If the removal or deactivation required maintenance, appropriate entries must also be made in the maintenance logs. The seventh and final step is for the pilot or an appropriately certificated mechanic to determine if the flight can be completed safely. This process can be hard to remember, and 91213 is a little difficult to read. To help, the FAA used to publish a flow chart. Unfortunately, when they decommissioned FSIMS in 2022, the chart disappeared. I've recreated and updated it for my students and put a link in the description if you'd like to download it. As practice, let's use the flowchart to walk through three examples. For our first scenario, during the pre-flight inspection of a Piper Archer 3, we notice all the fluid is leaked out of the magnetic compass. Can we make the flight? First, we know our Archer 3 does not have an MEL, so we can move on to the next question. Second, in looking at the TCDS, we see no mention of the magnetic compass in the equipment section. Third, we know the Archer 3 POH does not have a KOEL, so we'll move to the equipment list. Looking in Section 6, we see the magnetic compass is listed as Item 95, but the list doesn't make it clear whether or not it's required. So let's note that we might have a problem and move to the next step. Fourth, is the compass required by 91205 or 91207? It is. 14 CFR 91205B3 notes that a magnetic direction indicator is required. So, we can't make this flight without first fixing the compass. Let's move on to the second scenario. During the pre-flight of a 1978 Cessna 172N, we discover the stall warning doesn't work. Can we fly? If we were just relying on A tomato flames and flaps, it would appear the answer would be yes. But let's walk through the process. First, we know there's no MEL, so we'll move on. Second, for the 172N, the equipment section of the TCDS specifically mentions the stall warning is required. So that means we'll have to fix the stall warning prior to flying. For grins and giggles, let's continue the process. Third, the 172N doesn't have a KOEL. The equipment list, however, for the 172N not only lists the pneumatic stall warning, but it prefixes it with a dash R that indicates it is a required piece of equipment. So, here's another indication that the stall warning needs to be fixed prior to flying. 
For the third example, we've planned a night cross country in a Piper Warrior. However, during the pre-flight, we discover the landing light is not working. Referring to the flow chart, we know that our Piper Warrior does not have an MEL. Second, the landing light is not required by the TCDS. Third, the Warrior does not have a KOEL and the equipment list contains the landing light but does not list it as required. Fourth, 14 CFR 91205 requires a landing light but only if the flight is for hire. Since we're not flying for hire, the light's not required. Fifth, after searching the ADs, we're not able to find any that require the landing light. So far, there's no indication that we cannot make the flight, so we'll make sure the light is deactivated and we'll placard the switch as inoperative. However, before we fly, there is one more step. We need to consider whether the flight can be completed safely. In this case, we remember the destination airport is in the middle of nowhere. Runway lighting is minimal and it's forecast to be a high overcast. This means the airport will be very dark and it would appear very risky to make the flight. So prudence suggests that we should not fly until the light is repaired. Does this process make sense? Can you see why relying only on a tomato flames and flaps could lead to incorrect go no go decisions? If you like this video, please consider a donation through Buy Me A Coffee. The link is in the description below. Also, please comment, hit the thumbs up, and consider subscribing. Finally, this video only explores a part of what it takes for an airplane to be airworthy. For more information, I'd recommend watching this video next. <laughs> As always, thank you for watching, fly safely, and I will see you next time.